Hi friends. Welcome to the Share and Invite Proclaim channel. My name is Judy. Uh, I love maps. Uh, they show the way to your destination and they show what obstacles you might face like mountains or a road construction or the scenic route or the, the state roads versus the interstates. And you can calculate your distance and also your time of arrival. And let you know if you need a hotel or not. Well, believe it or not, the Apostle Luke gave us a road map of life. Those that were saved and those uh, who were lost. And the whole point is that eternity must be decided now before death. Um, in the present, heaven or hell are destinations on our map of life. Well, this is from these stories are from Luke 15 and 16. Uh, if you're new to uh, Christianity, you might not know these stories. Uh, but if you're a long-time uh, believer, they might be a good refreshment for you. Just in summary, first of all, before I go in depth, uh, there's a lost sheep in need of a shepherd. Uh, and uh, this lost sheep is valued so much that the shepherd leaves the 99 safe and goes to the one who is lost that needs recovering, that needs a rescue. Then there's a lost coin, and uh, a lady uh, has 10 coins. She, the nine are safe, but the one is lost, and she uh, goes about her uh, house looking diligently. She searches. She turns, she lights a light, uh, and uh, keeps searching until she finds uh, the lost coin. And if the lost person is, is a coin, then that coin, that lost person is so precious uh, that it will be found and in need of being found. Uh, then you have the lost son and the father has compassion upon the son that wants to take his, uh, his inheritance and and go to a far country and uh, squander it. Um, and he finally uh, comes home when he realizes how foolish he's been and asks for forgiveness from his father. And the father has compassion upon him and uh, uh, receives him and restores him to the family. And these three are particularly uh, focused towards the sinners that Jesus was in company of. Uh, they would show the sinner that they are so valuable to God uh, that uh, Jesus be willing would be willing to die for their uh, sin uh, and uh, restore a relationship with God. Then the uh, lost job of uh, chapter 16 in Luke uh, is pretty much directed towards the tax collectors and the uh, Pharisees. And it's about... Um, the deception of a manager. Uh, he managed an estate for an absentee owner and uh, word came back that he was uh, swindling uh, and uh, swindling the owner's goods and so he made a plan, a plan to uh, give him some future because he knew that he was going to get fired and so he cooked the books. Uh, and so we'll find out a little bit more about that in and he loved money. He was deceptive. And for the tax collectors, that was pretty much true. They, uh, they would collect more than what was due and they would skim off the top uh, and then they would turn in what was due for the taxes. And they became wealthy. And the Pharisees uh, loved money. And we find out in Timothy that the love of money is the root of all evil. So this lost job is a message to them that wealth, wealth can cause loss in eternity. And then the lost life, um, you have uh, uh, two characters, uh, one a wealthy man, one a poor man, and the poor man goes to heaven, the rich man goes to hell, and it shows that wealth is not going to determine your eternity. Um, and what will? determine your eternity. It's faith in Christ. Now let's go a little bit more uh, into these stories, elaborate a little bit more. The lost sheep, the, 
the setting is a pasture and there are 99 uh, saved sheep that are, uh, I mean, this is a pretty big herd. And, and, but anyway, one sheep was lost uh, and it was so valuable that the shepherd would leave the other 99 and go and search until he found the lost uh, sheep. And when he gets back, he celebrates the finding of the lost sheep, shows the value of this lost sheep. Um, and then uh, the whole point of that is that every person is valuable in God's eyes. It is the climax of the story. And then you have the lost coin. Something's going on here. Uh, I don't know, but I'll just continue. The lost coin is in a woman's home. And uh, the people around her are the, uh, it's her, her friends and neighbors. And uh, she has 10 coins. Nine are safe, but one is lost. And so the emphasis on the story is the search. She lights a lamp because um, these homes typically would have one entrance, the door, no uh, windows, and so it would be dark inside. So she would light the lamp and she would search. She would sweep the house. She would keep seeking until she found that lost coin because it was so valuable to her. And then she had a celebration when she found the lost coin. And even the angels celebrated because this coin was found. And that actually represents uh, the celebration in heaven over one person uh, who accepts Christ. Then you have the lost son, the third uh, story in uh, Luke 15. The setting is the father's estate. The people involved is uh, the father, his older son and younger son. And the son asked, the younger son asked the father for uh, his inheritance early. Typically this would be uh, given to him at uh, his father's death. But the father had compassion on his son and loved him and so he gave him uh, his a portion of the inheritance, probably property. Um, and so the son uh, converted all of that into money, took all of his possessions and left, and not intending to come back, he went to a far country, and there the scripture says that he spent all of his money in riotous living. He wasn't concerned about the future. Well, lo and behold, a crisis occurs, a famine in the land that leaves him with no money for food, and so he has to uh, do something that all Jews would hate to do. Uh, he was employed by a pagan, who would give him the job of feeding the swine. And that was the lowest, the lowest, the lowest occupation that a Jew could take. And so as he's feeding the swine, he's thinking, gosh, my, my father's hired servants uh, have more food uh, than this. And so he comes to his senses, as scripture says. That means he realized what a fool he had been. And so he decided that he had sinned, recognized his sin, and was going to go back home and, and tell his father that he had sinned and asked for forgiveness and tell the father that he didn't even deserve to be the son and, and would ask to be a hired servant. He was lost spiritually. Well, as he begins his way home, uh, the father sees him in a distance and runs to him. And he uh, kisses him, hugs him. Uh, he, he tells his servants to bring a robe, to put on shoes on his feet, a ring on his finger, to show how valuable he was to the father. And then, as they get back to the house, he orders to have a celebration, a feast, to celebrate that his son was dead spiritually and now alive spiritually. Well, the older son, comes in from the field and he is quizzing the servant, well, what's going on at, in dad's house? And so uh, the servant tells him that your brother has returned home. And so the older son gets indignant. He gets envious. He's kind of mad. Father comes out to him and says, uh, well, the son said, well, your, your, your son, not my brother, your son has done this, this, and this, and now you're celebrating. And and you've never had a party for me and my friends. And the father said to him, your brother, talking about 
relationships. He said, your brother was lost and now he's found. He was dead and now he's alive. And so the relationship was restored because of the father's love. And, might I say, because of the son asked for forgiveness and received mercy. Then uh, we have the lost job. Um, the lost job. The setting is an estate. The people involved is the estate manager, so that means that the owner was an absentee owner. Uh, disciples, may, the, probably the tax collector and the Pharisees uh, were the intended target of the story. And you also have the debtors in the story. Well, word came to the owner that the manager was wasting his goods. And so the manager was uh, going to be fired, but first he had to go to the debtors and record, make an accounting of what they owed the owner of the estate. And so the manager devised a plan, thinking that, hey, if I do this, then these debtors will be indebted to me and help me when I lose my job. And so he goes to the first debtor and he says, well, how much you owe, you owe a hundred measures, whatever that is, a hundred measures of oil. And write down in your uh, account, month, in your accounting journal that you only owe 50 measures of oil. Then he goes to uh, the debtor number two and he says, well, you owe a hundred measures of wheat, uh, but we'll write down that you only owe 80 measures of wheat. Wheat must have been more important than the oil. And so the manager returned his report. Basically, he cooked the books. He returned his uh, report to the owner. The owner was appreciative of the fact that he got his um, he, he got his uh, accounting, and that's what he wanted. Uh, and, you know, it was just like the rich man wanted. Uh, the point of the, the point is that the manager was wiser in his deception than what normal faith-believing people would, would be, and that his deception and his greed showed the wrong use of money. And the heavenly treasure, God's gifts, is the right use of money. And so this would speak to the, uh, the Pharisees who loved money. Uh, and it would speak to the tax collectors because they were greedy and taking too much money from the common people in terms of their collecting their taxes. Then you have the lost life. And this, uh, basically the setting is heaven and hell. And the people involved are a rich man and his five brothers, a poor man whose name is Lazarus, not the one that Jesus uh, raised from the dead in John, but a poor man named Lazarus, a common name, uh, Abraham, and some angels. Well, in the present life, uh, the rich man uh, feasted, feasted every day, had plenty. Um, and kept it all for himself. And right outside his gate was a poor man, a poor man who was hungry, a poor man who uh, was desiring the scraps from the rich man's table. He was also um, in need of health care. He had sores all over his body, and, and the unclean animal, like the dog, would come and lick his sores. Well, when they both die, they go separate ways. The poor man goes to heaven, the angels carry him to uh, Abraham, Father Abraham for the Jews, and uh, the rich man goes to hell. And there's a conversation between <clears throat> Abraham and this rich man. The rich man asks if he would send uh, Lazarus just to uh, touch uh, his tongue with a drop of water because he was in anguish. He was in pain. Sort of like the pain that the poor man felt when he had sores all over his body and had no food. Well, Abraham said, no, there's a uh, chasm between heaven and hell, and we can't go back and forth. He said, well, will you send Lazarus to warn my five brothers to not come to this place? And uh, Abraham, said, Abraham said, no. Uh, even if somebody came to them from the dead, and this was directed towards the Sadducees who were, 
the wealthy elite of the Sanhedrin, uh, who didn't believe in a resurrection anyway, uh, he said, uh, even if somebody came from the dead, they would not believe him. Sort of like many Jews who did not believe the resurrection of Jesus. And so he said, they have Moses and the prophets. They must decide before death their eternity. Um, just like the crooked manager and this rich man who used his wealth for personal gain, in the present life, the, you know, the believer faces uh, pain, maybe, maybe persecution for their belief in Jesus Christ. But in heaven, they are restored. Um, and the rich man who was depending upon his wealth goes to heaven because he refused to believe the word of God. So eternity is set before death. It's too late when you die. Well, the roadmap. The roadmap to eternity. Uh, if, you know, I think of Robert Frost and his poem, The Road Less Traveled, but here's the whole point. If you want recovery, if you want restoration, if you want uh, discovery of eternal life, then you must have faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, that he was buried and rose again, and uh, is coming again. Those five basic tenets of Christianity. Remember this in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. I hope that you share this with others who need to know something about these biblical stories and, and the meaning and the importance of them. Uh, I ask that you subscribe, click that bell, do all that stuff, respond, um, so that uh, you'll be notified of future um, future videos. Thanks for watching.